Some people say beans and grains didn't exist until 10,000 years ago and therefore are not our natural foods and our bodies aren't programmed to eat them and therefore we're actually meant to eat animal products. What does the best science have to say about this? I'd say the best science would be looking at hard outcomes. People who eat grains and beans live longer than people who eat animals. If you look at, at uh, the theories that have, people have come up with, 10,000 years of this, or you know, paleo that, or lectins and beans, you know, we actually want to see the data and look at hard outcomes. Heart attack, stroke, death, heart failure. And if you don't have that kind of data, it's hard to have real credibility around it. Uh, and the data shows that people who are eating grains and beans, fruits and nuts, actually do better, substantially better. The one exception uh, would be eating fish uh, in, as part of a Mediterranean diet. Wonderful, prospective, randomized trials. Uh, often labeled the diet of the year or something like that. I think that was this, this, this past year. The problem with it is that if you look at those, just put it in your search engine, Predimed trial, um, if you look at it, you find that uh, it only that 30% reduction in uh, cardiovascular events and death was actually only a reduction in stroke. Heart attacks were not reduced sub substantially, and death was not reduced, and yet that's the number one diet. So. Uh, my good friends who have worked on that, Dr. Rios, Dr. Estra, who have looked at, who have collected this data carefully, and you know, I may not agree with eating animals, but I certainly agree with the methodology. I know they had some issues with randomization, and they had to reanalyze and republish. I'm glad they republished because it got in front of people again how to do a study, uh, which I think it's a model of. Um, but without an improvement in, in death rate, no mortality benefit, that makes you question the entire thing because it was a, against a pretty high fat control diet and it didn't actually decrease in death. Now, if your goal was to decrease stroke, which I think is a wonderful goal, uh, it does work. Um, so I would say, you know, for uh, the people who are eating beans, you know, gr greens, leafy vegetables, all of them, uh, part of a normal, healthy vegetarian diet, those people are doing substantially better. Um, and uh, that uh, was a, a, a sidelight of this pros prospective trial. Um, that publication came out about four years ago from the Predimed people. They reanalyzed for mortality benefit. How many vegetables are you eating which is also a marker for how little animals you're eating, okay? Because people can only eat so much, and when they eat a larger percentage of vegetables, they're eating less animals. And they divided their group into five groups based on how much vegetables they were eating. And it turns out the last two groups, the one with the highest and the next to highest, those two actually had a lower mortality. It was a dramatic reduction in death. Inside the Mediterranean diet, if you did a vegetarian Mediterranean diet, or I think people are nicknaming it the vegetarian, okay, instead of Mediterranean. Um, uh, if you do a pro-vegetarian Mediterranean diet, you actually decrease death, decrease death. So how can somebody say that these uh, lectins and beans and the like are not good for you um, based on uh, a theory about 10,000 years ago, well, people have been eating beans for quite a long time ever since they were able to cook uh, because you really can't eat them raw. It's not going not gonna to work. Um, and they are a wonderful source of carbohydrate, protein, and even, you know, like soybean fat. Um, the effects are very clear that people who are eating them in outcome studies are have to do better than people who don't. So. Uh, I would challenge anyone who has a theory like the lectin thing, do a prospective randomized trial. Uh, we know how to do it. Uh, Predimed taught us how to do it. Do a prospective randomized trial, see what happens, five, ten years, uh, and then we can have a good conversation. Until then, no data, 
certainly not going to get away from uh, what we've what we've learned so far. Are hemp, flax, and olive oils good for us to eat? Should we try to include these oils in our diet, or should we try to avoid them entirely? You're mentioning things that have a fair amount of oil in them, and that is a concern to some people in the vegetarian world that you should eat no oils because it hurts endothelial function. Um, but then you have uh, people who say that you shouldn't eat things that have oils because the fat you eat is the fat you wear. I think both of those have some truth to them. What I don't have is randomized trials of taking uh, a no-fat versus a low-fat uh, vegan diet. I know they're both very helpful. I know people will lose weight on and have the weight loss be sustained uh, by doing this. Um, and what I would look for even there, same answer as <laughs> before, you want randomized trials. And so, you know, if you could take all of these named diets, you know, Furman, McDougall, Esselstyn, Ornish, um, and do randomized trials between them, uh, that would be really spectacular and we can answer questions like that. However, we have, I started to say, you know, bigger fish to fry, but probably not what I really want to say, <laughs> okay, uh, because of the, uh, see, it's mercury, saturated fat, uh, 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 the uh, PCBs, polychlorobiphenols, so let's not fry the fish. Um, as it turns out, um, if you compare any of those plant-based diets with a non-plant-based diet, they're going to do substantially better. Uh, and so doing the comparison among them, answering the differences between them, I'd like to know out of curiosity. I'm not so sure I, I need to know for my patients um, because they, they all save lives. Why? because there's no animals. Do you eat a 100% plant-based diet? And if so, for how long have you been doing it? So I, I haven't knowingly eaten a milligram of cholesterol since 2003 when I found out that my LDL cholesterol had climbed. It's not that interesting a story. It's really fairly typical. People don't realize that with age, slowing metabolism, the LDL cholesterol tends to rise. Um, and so they're always surprised, oh, my cholesterol is higher than it was. I haven't done anything different. Yeah, you did. You lived. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so, um, uh, but that particular timing for me um, was a big life change. That is, uh, I had sort of stopped, uh, went from being a tennis professional um, to being a coach when my kids were coming up. Uh, and one of my kids, uh, uh, my youngest son, was really good, really big, really strong, great fastball, great curveball, could play all nine positions, but he was an amazing tennis player. Uh, a couple of national titles and doubles and um, was highly ranked in singles. And I was his coach, and that meant that I was playing tennis essentially twice a day. We'd purposely take off Monday if he won the tournament on the previous Sunday. Well. Uh, what happens to junior tennis players? They grow up, they age out. Uh, in his case, he ended up playing Division I baseball for Valparaiso because, you know, the two-sport athlete, you know, they became too difficult in, in high school where he was highly successful his freshman year getting to late into the state uh, tennis and uh, being called up in between matches uh, to pitch for the baseball team. Uh, so as it turns out, um, uh, poor dad is back to work <laughs> instead of uh, doing high-level athletics all the time. And over a two-year period, my LDL cholesterol crept up from the LDL of about 115 to 170. Now, if I left that there, uh, th that would have been a, a, a short, probably a very short bad-term outcome. Uh, uh, and so um, when I measured that at the American College of Cardiology meeting in 2003, uh, fortunately that month the David Jenkins portfolio diet came out um, March of that year in um, the Journal of the American Medical Association. And so my AMA membership paid off because I saw the article and uh, I had stopped eating animals completely, started eating more plant sterols, uh, actually was taking the psyllium fiber uh, and the like, and within six weeks, my LDL cholesterol was down to 90. And so it stayed pretty much in that range. Um, I'm always interested in 
you know, prospective randomized trials of plant-based things that will lower your cholesterol, such as the psyllium, such as the plant sterols. Uh, the, the newest thing that I've heard from people and looked at it, and sure enough, there's trial evidence would be Indian gooseberry and uh, um, uh, Brazil nuts. And yeah, we're gonna, I think we're gonna get more and more data like this uh, where plants can specifically lower cholesterol. Why are we so interested in that? Uh, the the co correlation between LDL cholesterol and cardiac cardiovascular e events and mortality is very intense and very linear. And so how low would I like my LDL to go? Probably about 10, <laughs> okay? Uh, and people will argue about that, saying that, you know, in the past we actually thought that there was sort of a lower limit. If you get your LDL below 40, something bad will happen. Well, that, we got it below 40 and seemed to be doing okay. So, well, oh, 25, you can never go be below 25. Well, what'll happen if it goes below 25? Your immune system won't work. Um, you won't have wound healing. Uh, your, you know, your, no, your brain is all cholesterol, and so your brain won't work, and your, the myelin sheaths around your nerves will come apart. None of that was true, not one bit of it. It turns out that, um, and, and we learned this from the PCSK9 story, uh, which is worth talking about if people aren't familiar with it. Uh, there were people in the Dallas Heart Study who were found to have LDL of 7 or 10 or 14. They seem to be doing just fine and, you know, business people, aerobics instructors, that sort of thing. And they had this extremely low cholesterol, and genetically, which is part of the Dallas Heart Study, is to do the genome, they uh, had a mutation in the PCSK9 gene. PCSK9 is a molecule that's responsible for telling the liver's LDL receptors to quit, to, that gets uh, uh, taken in by the liver and chewed up and swallowed. And if you don't tell them to quit, then they keep taking LDL out of the bloodstream, and, the blood, and it gets very low. Well, these people don't have cardiovascular disease, number one, and they don't have neurologic or wound healing or any of the other things that we thought. Uh, so a whole science group has grown up around reproducing that for the common folks who don't have that mutation, and uh, that right now the leading products are antibodies that uh, will immobilize your PCSK9 and you inject it under the skin twice a month and your cholesterol goes plummeting. The early trials do show significant improvement in outcome, heart attack, stroke, and death. Um, and that is now an option, particularly for people with the, the genes where um, the PCSK9 is overworking or the LDL is under, uh, receptors are underworking, uh, so-called familial uh, hyperlipidemia. So we have some solutions that can really dramatically improve uh, the outcomes in people. Um, I would say, though, the, what we've learned is that there probably is no lower limit of LDL cholesterol below which people don't do even better. Uh, and you know, we may not be able to eliminate cardiovascular disease by lowering cholesterol, but we can certainly put a big dent of it. We don't have to be number one. What's the importance for you of the Real Truth About Health Conference? I think the real truth about health conference is getting in front of people, a large number of people. There's an audience in, uh, here, and according to my friends who are texting me, <laughs> uh, there are people online. Um, and uh, my best friends in Arizona, actually, they showed me a picture of uh, the, their dog who really likes me, looking at me on the screening, giving the, <laughs> giving the lecture. It's a broad audience. It's impacting a lot of people. Why is that so important to me? Uh, well, I like to st I'll tell the story tomorrow, um, but uh, last year was pretty special. It's when the century turned 18 years old. It's now an adult. Uh, you have a president who is in trouble every day. You have uh, 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 Russia fighting with uh, uh, over, the, over the Crimea with the Ukraine. You had the Boston Red Sox running away with the American League and destroying their opponent in the World Series. And if you haven't figured it out, I'm talking about 1918. Okay, that president was Woodrow Wilson. And what's significant about 1918, 
uh, for me as a cardiovascular practitioner is that it was the last year that in the United States heart disease wasn't the leading killer of Americans. It was knocked out for that one year by the Spanish flu epidemic. Spanish flu epidemic lasted three years, but by 1919, heart disease was number one again, okay? It's been there ever since. How do we stop it? When are we gonna get to number two? That was my career goal, so stated when I took over as president of the uh, American College of Cardiology. I wanna be number two. It doesn't look like it's gonna happen. Um, the obesity epidemic, uh, diabetes following it, is increasing m mortality again. So after four decades of steady decline, almost a 70% reduction, a lot of it attributed to what we do in cardiology, better recognition, door to balloon times, putting in stents, bypasses, doing defibrillators, you name it, we did it, death rates went down. Now they're going up again. And you really, as hard as we work in cardiology, the population really can outstrip our ability to protect the population? Yeah, how? Nutrition. Okay, the lousy nutrition that people are eating. And if we put together conferences that can impact and inform people of what they're doing to themselves and their poor future cardiologists, okay, maybe we have a chance. Maybe we can get to number two before I'm done. So that's why I think the real truth in health is, is, is so important. Reach that broad audience, make an impact, save their lives, save their families, save their neighborhoods. Uh, the entire community and save our country.